Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on the Old Testament survey. We are standing on two books on Zephaniah and Haggai. Before I could start with the session, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer, please? Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we submit us to your mighty hands and ask, Lord, that as we are going to learn from these books, Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us to understand your word and help us, Diana, to uh, teach us your word in a special way, Lord. Unite us together, bless each one of us, and help us to learn something new from your presence, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So if I could start, I will just share the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, you know. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just sharing the book of Zephaniah. When the book of Zephaniah was written by Zephaniah, who was the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the uh, son of Amariah, and the son of Ezekiah. So among the other prophets, we see something very different with Zephaniah uh, that is unique in the way he is introducing his long list of fathers long list of fathers and uh, yeah and uh, that itself is a very unique in nature the way uh, he is portraying he is listing uh, till Ezekiah so we may question why did Ezekiah I mean why did Zephaniah stop with Hezekiah most likely the prophet may wanted to highlight his royal lineage as a descendant of one of Judah's good king. So in the reference of Zephaniah 1 4, we see that in this place, you know, how he's introducing his uh, uh, fathers and great grandfathers. And the word Sephania means in Hebrew Yahweh hides or Yahweh has hidden. So Zephaniah was evidently born during the latter part of the uh, reign of King Manasseh and his name may mean that he was hidden from Manasseh's atrocities. Well, he was a very wicked and a cruel king and you know, it says like the history says that he was not good in nature, he was very cruel and yes, here we see Zephaniah been hidden from the king Manasseh. And yes, Nahum and Nahum, uh, yeah, Nahum and Jeremiah were Zephaniah's contemporaries. And let's look into a little bit of the background of Zephaniah. After the enlightenment of the reign of Hezekiah, Judah had endured 55 years under two of its worst kings, like Manasseh and Ammon. Amen. Uh, before Josiah was made king at the age eight in 640, he grew into adulthood. And we see uh, King Josiah proved to be the most godly or a good king of Judah. He experienced a personal spiritual awakening uh, in 632 at the age of 30, at the age of 16. And after the law was discovered in 622, he led a uh, nationwide revival among, among the people of Israel or the people of Judah. So this has been recorded in uh, you know, Second Chronicles chapter 34. So on the whole, we see that Zephaniah is a fierce and uh, grim book of warning about the coming of the Lord, uh, coming of the Lord and the desolation, darkness and ruins will strike Judah and the nations because of the wrath of God upon sin. So Zephaniah looks beyond judgment, however, to a time of joy when God will cleanse the nation and restore the fortunes of his people, Israel. 
The book begins with God's declaration uh, in chapter 1, verse 2. We see that I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth. But it ends with this promise. At that time, uh, you know, in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 20, it says that, at that time, I will bring you in and restore your fortunes before your eyes. And the purpose, the purpose of this book we see in the notes is to warn of the coming of the Lord. And, uh, and many Israelites thought it would be a day for rejoicing. But Zephaniah is revealing that, uh, no, it's not a time to rejoice for you guys because uh, idolater, uh, idolaters, uh, 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 idolaters, Israelites, they considered God's enemies, just as the Canaanites had been. It is not nationality, but spirituality that counts. And the second purpose we see that to hold out hope for a remnant that will survive God's judgment. And we see Zechariah uh, lived in the final decade of the southern kingdom of Judah. And, uh, you know, when we start with the chapters, we see in the first chapter talks about Israel was too far. Zephaniah is saying that, Israel, you have gone too far worshipping other gods and uh, you were too entrenched in the life of the people. And it ended up that Josiah's pride led him to a tragic death on the battlefield. As he set Jerusalem on a collusion course with Babylon, and Zephaniah is saying that he had seen all of this coming. For years, he had been warning the leaders of Jerusalem, saying that, um, you know, uh, through the collection of poetry, he's saying in chapter one, we see. Oh, wait, let me see. Taken. Just trying to. Guys, the connection was dropping. I'm very sorry. So, chapter one, verse two to three. Chapter one, um, chapter one to chapter two, verse three talks about the. Uh, it first focuses on the day of the Lord's judgment coming on Judah and Jerusalem, and in chapter two. Uh, till chapter 3, it talks about the second part is about the day of the Lord's judgment on the nations of Jerusalem again. And chapter 3, from verse 9 to 20, it talks about, then the third section explores the hope that remains for the nations and for Jerusalem on the other side of God's judgment. Give me a minute, please. Sorry about this interruption. Thank you. So the first section opens with this shocking reversal of Genesis chapter 1. So it talks about uh, um, uh, so God's good and ordered world is going to descend back into disorder and darkness and chaos becoming uninhabitable once again. 
And so we keep reading, we realize that Zephaniah is developing all of these powerful poetic images to describe how Jerusalem world is going to end. And all of the cities, institutions for worshiping the gods of the Canaanites can be destroyed. And we also see all the leaders who are, uh, uh, you know, who are leading with injustice and all the economic centers where uh, we're leading in an uh, unhealthy manner or by uh, crooked ways of lending and borrowing of money to place. And all of it is going to uh, um, gonna be along with the city. And Zephaniah develops all these almost, uh, you know, ap apocalyptic images to show the significance of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. It all refers to the great army that is coming to take out Jerusalem. Now it's interesting that Zephaniah never mentions uh, whose army God's going to use to bring the judgment upon this nation. Though uh, the other prophets like Micah or Habakkuk uh, had mentioned that it's Babylon, but Zephaniah never mentions that in his book. And it's because he wants to highlight God's role in orchestrating the things around the rise and fall city. So with this, we will move on to chapter 2. So in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, we see actually that uh, what gives Zephaniah a kind of hope that Jerusalem as a whole can avoid its fate. But in the closing poem of section 1, he calls on anyone in Jerusalem who would seek the Lord. And he says, these will make up the faithful remnant people uh, who could be spared if they repent. And in the second section, chapter 2, verse 4 to chapter 3, verse 8, Zephaniah widens the focus to include the nation around Judah. So here we see the Philistines, the Moabites, the neighboring places, you know, he, he recalls them, saying that the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and uh, even the Assyrians, and he accuses all of them for the corruption, the violence and arrogance, and he predicts that all of them will fall before Babylon. And with this, we will move on to chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. What's shocking is that final people group targeted in the section are the Israelites in Jerusalem. So it's the leaders and prophets and uh, the priests of Israel are so corrupt and violent, so estranged from their God that he doesn't even recognize them as his people anymore. Just imagine that. And now the section ends with God's final decision. And he says that he's going to gather up all the nations, including Jerusalem, and you know he's going to pour out his uh, of wrath, God's wrath, God's anger upon them, and God will bring justice uh, uh, by uh, by in form of a consuming fire that devours evil from the land, which is really intense for the people to hear. And so the following line that brings a uh, uh, brings a final part to a conclusion is that uh, we see that uh, in chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, uh, begins like God says that He is going to heal and transform the rebellious nation into one unidentified family. So, in chapter 1 and 2, we see how God is going to bring a correction, what is the punishment been expected, the judgment upon, um, uh, upon uh, Jerusalem. But in chapter 3, we see a message of hope. In all, uh, uh, till now, whatever we have studied about the major prophets and the minor prophets, whenever they prophesied for you know, the judgment upon the sin, I, I won't say upon the city, upon the nation, but then the sin nature brought judgment. But at the same time, you see uh, the, uh, the prophets also giving a message of hope. When you repent, God will forgive you. See, most of the time they have been highlighted by saying God is a punishing God. But at the same time, what is causing the punishment? We need to see that it's our sin, the people's sin, the nature of their rebelling against God. The very law that God gave people not to worship others. But what happened to Israelites? Why are they going after other gods, the gods of the Baals? So this is what bringing the wrath of God, stirring the wrath of God. 
God. Or, you know, they started doing unnecessary sacrifices, the child sacrifice. All these things have been introduced in the people's culture, which is not right. And God stands against it. And here God says, I'm going to judge them. And with that, the chapter three gives a message of hope saying that I, uh, you know, after being purified, after they have been judged, I'm going to uh, restore them back. There's a restoration uh, because I have promised Abraham, he, uh, the prophet goes back to the book of Genesis chapter 12, 15 and 17. He recalls the Abraham covenant that God did with Abraham, that I will bring a restoration. I will bless the nation and Jerusalem will be blessed. So in chapter three, the confusion verse from verse 11 to 20 says the confusion of the book focuses on the restaurant of the city city at the center of the nation. So God's presence is there in the restored city. Along with that faithful remnant that's been humbled and transformed by God's mercy. And they are called to sing and rejoice. And then in the striking image, we are told that God is a poet who wants to sing to you know, very beautifully, uh, that verse, he says, uh, chapter 3, verse 17, that God will live among you and he will celebrate you with songs of joy. Zephaniah says. And uh, this poem closes uh, with a very powerful image that God is gathering his family together. The poor, the broken, and he exalts them in a place of honor. And that's how the book ends. The uh, little book of Zephaniah, it contains some of the most intense image of God's justice and love that we can find anywhere in the prophets. So God won't tolerate the horrible things, the sin, nature from that. But then at the same time, he's a God who restores us. He's a God of justice, but at the same time, he's a God of God who restores, God who brings hope. He, uh, you know, he restores uh, people. He will give, he will give, he will flourish them. He will give them the safety because this is our God. God is a God of refuge, God of peace, uh, God of strength, God of love. And we see that Zephaniah uh, uh, forces us to hold together these two aspects of God's character. What are this? That is, yes, he's a justice God, but at the same time, he is loving as well. And he wants us to discover that together they contain the future hope of our world too. So uh, how can we uh, portray Christ in this book? We see that um, Zephaniah uh, portrays Christ in two occasions in Zephaniah chapter 1, 3, and uh, you know, he relates it with the book of Matthew as well. So, uh, and uh, Zephaniah 1 15. So, in both these uh, scriptures, we see that the, uh, that the day of the Lord is associated with Christ's second advent. So although the Messiah is not specifically mentioned in the book of Zephaniah, but it is clear that he is the one who will fulfill the great promise that he's talking about in chapter 3, verse 9 to 20, at the time of conclusion, that he will gather his people, the poor, the broken, the wounded, the oppressed, the depressed, he will bring all them together and he will reign in victory. So yes, Christ was born to each of us. He was born, um, he humbled himself and he was born among the poor so that we can be restored. So what we can learn from the book of Zephaniah? very beautiful verse we see that in Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 18, the first part of verse 18, we see that neither silver, uh, they, sorry, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. So what we need to see here is we need to be focused on the God. We need to set our hearts right. Because uh, the book of Zephaniah says very clearly certain things. Our worship matters, our justice matters, and our humility matters. Three things. Worship. Worship the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. Worship Him in spirit because He is our God. 
Let there be a true worship. Do not worship any other gods. Yes. Now, we may not worship any other god, but then are we having any kind of idols, any kind of likings towards something else other than God? We need to check ourselves and see to it our worship is only to God and not to any other things around us which may take our worship. And we also see this book also talks about the justice. For Zephaniah, he says the justice matters to God. In, the, in the chapter 3, verse 5, he says that the Lord within her is righteous and he does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses justice and every new day he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. Sorry if there's some sound coming from outside, you know, they're doing some drilling work outside. It's the government who's doing so, I'm not able to avoid it. Sorry about it. And the, the final point here is humility. The humility matters. So in chapter 2, we see that Zephaniah calls us to seek the Lord, seek righteousness, and seek humility. There are three things that this chapter talks about that we in our daily life need to apply in these three things. Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, and seek humility. Because in these things, when we actively seek, we find ourselves in God's plan by fulfilling his purpose in our life. So with this, we conclude the book of Zechariah. If there's any questions, if you would like to, thank you, Divya. If you would like to uh, add on, Please feel free to add before we could mo move on to the next book. Hey, guy. And these are some of the key verses we have here. These are some of the key verses. Um, yeah, can I request each one of us to take turns and read these scriptures, please? There are six scriptures listed. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is with you, the mighty, the mighty warrior who says, He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Yes, the next person can read the other scriptures. Each one take turn and read all the six. Shephaniah chapter 1 verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have, uh, who have upheld his justice, Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 5. But the Lord is still in the city. He does what is right and never what is wrong. Every morning without fail, he being justice to his people. And yet the unrighteous people, they keep on doing wrong and not ashamed. Zechariah, Zephaniah chapter, hope I'm right, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. At that time, at that time you, my people, will no longer need to be ashamed that you will rebel against me. I will remove everyone who 
who is proud and arrogant, and you will never again repent against me on my first you. Verse 12. I will leave this, I will leave there a humble and a lowly people who will come to, to me for help. Amen. The last verse. That's my thing. He said, The time is coming. I will punish your oppressors. I will rescue all the lame and bring an exile home. I will turn their shame to honor and all the world will praise them. Amen. 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 It's so beautiful that each key verse that we can claim in our life. Would you like to share that how these verses is, has helped each one of us in our daily life and our spiritual walk? Is there anyone in the class who would like to share something about these scriptures? Sephaniah 317, that particular verse uh, uh, has, uh, has spoken to me much, uh, uh, especially uh, in, in one version it says, He'll quiet you with his love, he'll rejoice you uh, with singing. I think it's, in this version it is different. He'll take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing that that really shows how much uh, you know, God is uh, concerned about, uh, you know, who cares about each person individually and how much he delights uh, in each person. Uh, like, just like a parent would do to a child, even more than that, I would say. Yeah, we are his creation. So, uh, yeah, and it also talks about... Uh, uh, the his presence is our strength, right? The mighty warrior who saves. Uh, so yeah, it is very beautiful. Yeah, when I think about that, to us. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Divya, for sharing that. Yes, the Lord our God is with us. The mighty warrior who saves us, and uh, He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke us but will rejoice over us with singing. So even when I uh, read, I came across this verse for the first time, it made me rejoice, saying that, hey, my God rejoices over me. And he rejoices over me and he sings. You know, it makes him sing around me. So that delighted me and, uh, and it made me very happy to know that, you know, God rejoices over that was a very, uh, I mean, it was a very comforting verse during the time when you are going through a difficult season and a verse like this brings and delights your heart and comforts you that, you know, yes, as Divya said that God is more than a father and a mother of our earthly parents because he is our creator, our God, and he is with us and he rejoices over us. It's like amazing to know that. And he sings around us. It's actually literal, you know, God actually does it. We can take literally because this is what he means and he means every word that he says and it is actually God rejoices over us. Okay. Uh, yeah, but this we will move on to the uh, next book. Okay, guy. Uh, I think there's some problem with the internet. I Switch off the video so that we'll have a good clarity. Yeah, thanks. So the book of Haggai. So the uh, the Haggai was the author of this book, and it's named after him. And uh, even in the book, we see that nine times his name has been mentioned. And the book.
both Hagar and Zechariah are named by Ezra in his book. When we studied the book of Ezra, we would have come across Hagar and Zechariah. Well, like Nehemiah, who would come to Jerusalem much later to rebuild its walls, and we see Haggai was a man of action. After the temple had stopped for 15 years from completion, it took Haggai just 23 days to inspire and exhort people to resume the work of the Lord. And then the work would finally be completed about, you know, uh, in uh, 515 BC with Ezekiah's exhortation to the people. So Ezekiah, uh, sorry, Haggai's exhortation to the people. Now, Haggai's name is probably derived from Hebrew word called Ham, H-A-G, Ham, which means festival, which means festival. It may also be an abbreviated form of Haggai, uh, uh, means the festival of Yahweh. So thus, Hagar means festive or festive, possibly because he was born on the day of the, uh, the major feast of the tabernacles. The first group of Jews who returned to Babylon, or returned from Babylon in the first exile in 538 BC, uh, which we saw in Ezra chapter 1, and in 536, uh, the uh, second uh, began in 536, they began to rebuild the temple. And uh, in about 535, however, deeply discouraged and uh, under the intense opposition of the people around them, the work had stopped or halted for about 15 years, almost 15 years. And after 15 years, in uh, 520 BC, God raised Haggai and Zechariah to encourage the people, to exhort them to tell them to rebuild and uh, to rebuild the temple and not only the temple but also the personal holy to rebuild the spiritual life in them. So the very purpose of this book is the four points to warn against the negligence against uh, doing on God's work. Second, to encourage the rebuilding of the temple. Third, to give instruction in holiness, to build their life spiritually and to show God's faithfulness. Right. When we turn to the book of Haggai in the year 520 BC, nearly 70 years after the exile, the Babylonian Empire had recently collapsed and the world is now ruled by the Persians. And now these Persians ruler allowed the exiles, the Israelite exiles, to get back to their own place, to go back to Jerusalem, uh, uh, which is still still under ruins. So under the leadership of a high priest who's named Joshua, there are many Joshuas. So here during this time, during the time of Ezra Haggai, there was a high priest called Joshua. So with his leadership and Zerubbabel, who was the governor, at that time and you know the day leadership they come back to uh, Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls and the temple and now uh, we need to remember recall the story from the book of Ezra chapter 1 to 6 where our hopes are high I mean, to building the temple and the city walls. So the book consists of four sections now the book of Haggai has four sections let me see Okay, the book has uh, four sections, only two is listed, I can tell you. So from chapter 1, 1 to 15, he opens with an accusation of the people, misplaced the priorities. One second. Okay. Four sections and in first, okay, that is chapter 1, 1 to 15, here Haggai opens up the accusation of the people of misplaced priority. So yes, they have come back to Jerusalem, but they are spending all of their time and their resources in rebuilding their own houses. Why? The temple of the Lord is still under ruin. And it's 
almost 70 years it's under halt. So Haggai asks the people of Israel, are your own home houses really more important than being loyal to God? This neglect of people, Haggai says, it's equal to the covenant rebellion of their ancestors and he quotes from Deuteronomy 28, 22 to 40. He says, you know why you are not being fruitful in the land? You are not being unproductive because you don't, uh, there's no blessing in the work of your hands because we have not focused on God, restoration of the temple, setting up the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the spiritual priorities are right for God. Instead, you have been selfish and you're only focusing of yourself and building your homes than being focusing on God first. So he tries to get the people's focus right so that there will be a blessing upon them and their families. And here we also see uh, Zerubbabel. We are told as Zerubbabel uh, was the governor and Joshua who was the high priest, a remnant of people were provoked by Haggai's message and they were motivated also and they started rebuilding the temple. And in chapter 2 verse 1 to 9 we see that Haggai follows up one month later. He addresses some problems of shattered expectation among the people. The temple that are rebuilding is really pretty unimpressive. It is nothing compared to the glory of the temple Solomon had built uh, year about uh, 500 years earlier. So the morale was really low for finishing the project. So Haggai reminds the people of the great prophetic promises of the future kingdom of God about this temple. temple. He draws from the earlier prophets, especially from the book of Isaiah and also from the book of Micah uh, about the new Jerusalem. He talks about the great splendor of God and uh, it, would, uh, it would be the place uh, from which God would redeem the whole world and uh, all the nations would come and participate in God's kingdom resulting in the era of peace. So the temple plays a, a key role in God's plan for the future and Haggai calls on the people to work and hope despite the disappointing circumstance. So with this we will move on to the second half of chapter 2 uh, which is the third section. Here you see Haggai follows up uh, two months later with a call of covenant faithfulness. He reminds people to keep the Torah. He, he gives a scripture. He is just not talking or exhorting people because uh, we can also learn from Haggai saying that sometimes uh, when we speak with our motivational words, um, yes, it will motivate people. But to see a change, a transformation in the heart, we need to speak the scripture. We need to give the scripture from uh, scripture. The Only the scripture has the power to change a person, to transform the person. And so time and again we see the prophets and also in the New Testament we see the disciples quoting scriptures because there is power in the word. And here we see Haggai quoting uh, the covenant, quoting the scriptures, quoting Torah and he says, uh, see the covenant failures will lead us to unproductiveness, unfaithfulness. And now again in chapter 2, the second half of chapter 2, again he's quoting the uh, Torah, the scriptures, and he says, listen, when we follow this covenant faithfulness that we need to keep, he engages some of the priests in a conversation about the ritual purity. And then he remembers the key ideas from the book of Leviticus and he says if someone goes and touches a dead body and becomes ritually impure or marked by death, then they go and touch some food. Is that food impure too? So the priest, knowing the book of Leviticus, says yes, it is impure. Then Haggai turns this into a parable and he says this is how it is with the people of Israel. And what they are putting their hands to in rebuilding the temple. So if the current generation does not humble themselves and if they do not turn from their injustice and you know the pathetic way that they are leading life. And Haggai says whatever they build with their hands including the new temple will be impure too. So he is highlighting some of the incidents for them to 
understand. And here it regards challenges that it is only by the true repentance and covenant faithfulness that their building efforts will result in God's bringing his kingdom and blessing. So in a sense, we see that Israel's future lay in their hands. So God is waiting for his people to be faithful. So the choice that Haggai is laying before the exiled generation is very similar to the challenge Moses gave the wilderness generation before entering the land. Their obedience will lead to blessing and uh, success while faithfulness will lead to ruin. The book concludes with Haggai's summary of the future hope of God's kingdom. So he's going to make the new Jerusalem the center of his glorious international kingdom. From there, he will confront and defeat evil from the nation. Your Haggai also reminds people of the defeat of Pharaoh's army from the Exodus story. And God will fulfill here his promise to David and establish the king from his line. So uh, the, uh, here we see that how Christ is portrayed in this book. Christ is portrayed as the, uh, uh, in, in the, in the second temple, is to have God's redemptive plan. So Herod the Great later, who spent a fortune on the project of enlarging and enriching this temple, and it was filled with the glory of God incarnated every time Christ came to Jerusalem. So the Messiah is also portrayed in the person of Zerubbabel. That I will take you, Zerubbabel, and I will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you. In chapter 2, 23, you see that Zerubbabel becomes the center of the messianic line and is like a signet ring, sealing both the branches together. So how do we apply? How do we uh, conclude this book? Before we can conclude, let me go through some of the key verses of the book of Haggai. Can I request each of us to take up each scripture, four of us to take each scripture and read, please? Chapter 1, verse 4. Is it a time for you, you yourself to be living in your panel houses while this house remains a ruin? Haggai 1.5, now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. Yeah, anyone from the team would like to pick up the scripture and read it out, please. Haggai chapter 1 verse yeah, chapter 1. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Amen. Amen. Haggai 2.9, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So if you see on each scripture, the verse, the first one, verse 1, 4, it says, it is a time for you yourself to live in a paneled house while this house remains a ruin. That's a question asking what happened. So unlike the scripture, we can also apply it to ourselves. Yes, we may be focusing on many things, rebuilding many things, our vision, our plans, our career, our growth in our professional life, personal life. But are we also focusing on our spiritual life? Today, we can take this book and apply it to our personal life. Are we focusing on our spiritual life to be rebuilt? You know, it's so important that we build our spiritual life better. And then we see in one chapter 1, verse 5, and this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. Proverbs also says that, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and a greater understanding. So we need to have this fear of the Lord. How? By giving a careful thought to our way of life. And then in verse 13, it says, 
the Lord's messenger gave this message to the Lord, to the people, that I am with you. This is such a promise that God gives from the time of Moses, from the time of Abraham, to every season, to every prophet, saying that I am with you. Again and again, time and again. This is a greater promise that he gives to his children. You are never alone. I am with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you, declares the Lord. And in Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, talks about the glory. Don't worry, don't worry, don't look at the temple how it is now, but there is a greater glory in the former house where the Lord Almighty says, and in this place that I will grant peace, declares the Lord. There is a greater glory talking about Jesus himself and he is present. This is a greater glory that we need to await. Now, when they were waiting for Jesus coming, and we are also waiting for Jesus' second coming, the greater glory of Lord himself being with us. So this is a promise, this is also a comfort in the book that where we can take as an encouragement and construct uh, or build ourselves spiritually uh, looking uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also having a watch over our life and our daily life so that you know we are a vessel of honor pleasing God in our life. And not only be focused about ourselves, but always all the messages ends with the uh, with the evangelical tone, where we need to be like the prophets. We need to go around talking to people about the good news of Jesus. So each and every book ends with that: that the coming of the Lord is near. That we need to share the good news with others, just like how the prophets are doing in their time. So with this, we will take a short break. And before we could take a break, is there anything that you would like to add on to this book, share? And then after a short break, we can uh, go through the, uh, the last two books of the Old Testament, Zechariah and Malachi. So is there anything that you would like to add, share about these two books, whatever we studied? Okay, let's take a 10 minutes break and come back. Thank you. God bless. Let's take a short break. 